see, him having a nine to five only gets the family fed. Being the manager of the Jackson Five gets him bits. And that's what's important to a Leo. Bits. <laughs> Bugs. Hello there, Bellas. If you have not already done so, please remember to like, share to Facebook, whatever your handle is, whether it be Twitter, Twitch, Tiki Talkie. Like I said, I don't know if you can share videos over there on Tiki Talkie. I don't know. Share it over there or tell a friend. That's another way you can do it. Tell a friend about it. Subscribe and check out uptopbeauty.com. You see this hat? You like it? Ooh. This is currently on sale at uptopbeauty.com. In fact, everything is on sale at uptopbeauty.com. And to sweeten the deal, if you are one of the first three to spend over $65, that will include the shipping fee you will get a free we've been reading with uptown Nawab tote and if you are not already a part of this book club please hit the patreon link below and or the join button here on the youtube and for a small monthly fee of five five dollars you can be privy to all the shenanigans before the YouTube gets it, if the YouTube gets it. Now, let's continue talking about Michael Jackson by Ter Terrible Lele. Ever since Michael Jackson was a teenager, the public has speculated about his personal life, straight, gay, or even asexual. It is fascinating that the sexual proclivity of a performer with as much on stage sexual appeal as Michael has always been such a mystery. Ah, uh, sexual appeal during the thriller, yes, because I was young and I didn't know what a man was. I told y'all and I will forever tell y'all, it's that goddamn Jackie Jackson and that Jermaine Jackson. Now who I would cl cl what tree I would climb first? will be that goddamn Jermaine. Then once I come down from the tree, you know, I might sashay my ass over there to the jacket. But, you know, if you think that Michael Jackson was sexy, okay, shouts to La Vista to you. At an early age, Michael received mixed signals about sex. The message from Catherine was loud and clear. With her strong faith as a Jehovah's Witness, lust in thought or in deed was considered Sinful. However, from Joseph, who shunned the religion Catherine had embraced, the boys received a message that came more from his actions than from his words. In the group's early days, Joseph, the boys, into dives in strip clubs, ordinarily strict, he apparently gave his son free reign at those times, allowing nine-year-old Michael to stand and watch as the male audience leered and whistled at voluptuous women who stripped until naked on stage. Once, Michael watched in fascination as a well-endowed stripper took off everything but her underwear. Then, at just the right moment, she pulled two large oranges from her bra and took off a wig to reveal that she was actually a hit. Exposing your child to adult-like lust, even though some of us were still children when we uh, lost our virginity. I was, I was a teenager. But purposefully exposing your child to adult lustful actions is a crime. You allowing your children. Now it's one thing if they snuck off and they did it on their own. But you, as a parent, allowing your children, your boys, your young boys, to see things like this at a young age 
It's confusing. The child doesn't know what to do with those feelings. So if Michael was the one out of the six boys who was confused or um, hesitant about his sexuality, I get it. Because not every child can process those things appropriately. You know what I'm saying? Jermaine processed it. Jackie processed it. Oh, my Tito. Damn, my Tito. When y'all told me Tito was the cheater. Ah, oh, God damn. What is this world coming to when the Tito Jackson cheat on you, girl? Damn. But Michael Jackson, I don't believe he processed it well. When the boys played the Peppermint Lounge in Chicago, there was a peephole in their dressing room through which they had a clear view into the ladies' bathroom. They would each take turns peering into it. We learned everything there was to know about ladies, Marlon recalled. Some years later, the group was performing in London when Michael, 13, and Marlon, 14, discovered a peephole that looked directly into an adjoining dressing room occupied by theater star Carol Chan. <laughs> see her naked not the old Carol Channing but the young one the young Carol Channing I mean because if I want to look at something old and wrinkly I could just look in the damn mirror I was telling my sister the other day I said sister I feel like my body is full of mayonnaise like a sandwich look she's naked Marlon said excitedly as he peered through the hole I can't look Michael protested but she's naked Marlon enthused Carl Channing is naked. Michael took a quick look. Ugh, he groaned. She's naked. It's safe to say that these kinds of experiences would impact on Michael for the rest of his life. At nine, Michael was not psychologically equipped to fully understand any sexual stimulation he may have received from what he had witnessed, such as strip teases. He must have been conflicted. He had an overly rigid view of the world from his mother and an overly promiscuous view of the world from his father. The father's infidelity would certainly have hit the younger child exposed to it the hardest. In this case, that would have been Michael since he was the youngest member of the group, privy to Joseph's discretion. It would be years before his younger brother and sister, Randy and Janet, would know about their father's philandering. In 1968, Joseph would earn only $5,100 rather than his usual eight to 10000 He would give up relative financial security in order to gamble on his family's future. Yeah, see, see him having a nine to five only gets the family fed. Being the manager of the Jackson 5 gets him bitches. And that's what's important to a Leo. Bitches. And attention. However, the gamble quickly paid off. The boys started making $600 per engagement. With the influx of money, Catherine and Joseph were able to redecorate their home and buy their first color television. Michael has recalled that as Joseph got older, he became more violent. It became a running theme in his young life. His father was a bully and he would have to live with it. If you messed up during rehearsal, you got hit. Michael would remember, sometimes with a belt or a switch. What we know from other books is that at least Joseph wasn't a sucker. He wasn't the kind of person that just beat on the weak, meaning just his children. Joseph, if you want that action, oh, he'll give it to you. At about this time, 1968, when Michael was almost 10, the Jacksons faced a family crisis. 18-year-old Maureen Reby was falling in love with Nathaniel Brown, a devout Jehovah's Witness. She announced that she wanted to marry him and move to Kentucky. Catherine, happy for her daughter, encouraged her. In Catherine's view, there was no more important role for any of her daughters to play than that of being a wife and a mother. However, Joseph was against the marriage. It was all cooked up by Maureen and her mother. He would later explain. 
I wasn't happy about it because Maureen Reby, as she was known in the family, had a powerful singing voice. Her father had hoped she would consider a career in show business. He felt that if she married and raised a family, she would never be able to devote her attention to the entertainment field. We know that Reby can get busy because she did the Centipede album. We know she can get busy, but it seems what was more important to her was being a wife and a mother. Reby lived a regular life. Remember, her husband was a school bus driver. She preferred the comfort and security of a happy home life to the instability of show business. Also, of course, Reby wanted to get out of that house there was always so much drama occurring within the walls of that small home on Jackson Street. From the exuberant high when the boys would win a talent show to the crashing low when they were chased and bullied by Joseph. Reby wanted out. Who could blame her? As it would happen, her defection from the ranks would be just the first of such crises in the family, as several of the children chose to marry at an early age against their father's wishes in order to get away from him, from that house. You hear me? Get the fuck. Listen, as the older sister, what I would do, and I'm sure Reby did, set all the siblings down. Listen. You get the fuck away from this house as soon as you can. And don't you come back. You get away from all the of The arguments went on for weeks until finally Joseph relented. Fine. Reby could get married. However, however, he would have the final word. He would not give her away. After winning another talent contest, this one at Beckman Junior High in Gary, the boys were brought to the attention of a man named... Gordon Keith, who owned a small local label called Steel Town Records. Keith immediately signed the brothers to a limited record deal. Two singles were eventually released on Steel Town in 1968. Big Boy backed with You've Changed and We Don't Have to Be Over 21 to Fall in Love, backed with Jam Session. Both were mediocre numbers that don't really hint at Michael Jackson's potential as a vocalist. But the boys were thrilled with them just the same. In May 1968, the group was invited back to the Apollo to perform and this time be paid for their appearance. They were on a bill with Etta James, Joseph Simon, and another family group, the Five Stair Steps. And QB, a singer, was just two years old. I'm like, who is the other family group? Why are people being so damn evasive about this? Like, it's like you can't say the Silver's name. Because remember when we read LaToya's book? LaToya was like, I don't want to say the other family group. But the other family group was a bit ratchet. You know, they didn't know how to eat steak. So we had to have hot dogs and hamburgers because they didn't know how to use utensils. I'm like, what is that about? While Joseph was at the American Federation of Musicians Hall in New York, filling out certain forms for the Apollo engagement, he met a young white lawyer by the name of Richard Ahrens. After talking to him for just a few moments, Joseph asked Ahrens, to help him manage his sons. Remember how they talk about uh, Joseph not having real business acumen? Joseph relished the idea of having white assistance, a preference that would cause problems for him in years to come. Aaron's, as a co-manager, began seeking concert bookings for the group while jo Joseph tried to interest the record industry in them. At one point, he tried to contact Barry Gordy, president of Motown, by sending him an audio tape of some of the Jacksons' songs. There was no reaction from Gordy or from anyone else at Motown. Do he not know that he didn't sign the contract with Steel Town? In 1968, when the Jackson Five played the Regal Theater in Chicago, Motown recording artist Gladys Knight arranged for some of Motown's executives, but not Barry, to attend the show. 
There was some interest in the group at the time. Word got back to Barry that the Jacksons were an up and coming act, but still there was no interest for him in terms of signing them to the label. In July, 1968, when Jackie was 17, Tito 14, Jermaine 13, Marlon 10, and Michael 9. The group performed at Chicago's High Shapiro Club as an opening act for a group called Bobby Teller and the Vancouver's. After he saw the Jackson boys in action, Taylor telephoned Ralph Seltzer, head of Motown's creative department and also head of the company's legal division to suggest that the group be allowed to audition for Motown. Mommy, you say that you know. 